Transport links have always played an important part in the capital's economic growth. These days, London does much of its business on a global level, and its international status as an economic power depends on its airports, the gateways to the rest of the world. Finding space for an airport near to a big city is never going to be easy. But somehow today, London has no less than five major airports, which handle some 130 million passengers every year. How did this come about? And how can we cope with increased capacity in the future? This is Heathrow, the world's busiest international airport. And we're right in the middle of it here. Even though there are roads all over the place, there are actually planes landing on a runway over there every 90 seconds and taking off every 90 seconds from a runway over there. The reason it's so cramped is that when it was built, London was already the world's biggest city and there wasn't much room for two 4,000 metre runways, so they had to cram it all in together. Heathrow may be the capital's biggest airport, but it wasn't opened until 1946, and that was almost 30 years behind London's first one, which was in the savage outback of Surrey. Croydon now seems an unlikely place for the capital's premier airport, but back in 1917, it was ideal. This is the original site of Croydon Airport, and if you look, it started over there, and the reason was they needed a long run into the wind to take off. OK, those propeller-driven planes weren't terribly powerful, and if you go into the wind, you get more lift and you take off more easily. Now, in this part of the country, well, indeed, in this country, the prevailing wind is from the southwest. It's, it's towards those big bushes over there, and therefore they would have wanted to go that way, so they needed to start over there and come into the wind. And we can just check and see where the wind is coming from by using a wind sock, which was how they used to do it. And indeed, you still find wind socks on airfields today. And the wind blows in and pushes it away, so you know the wind's coming from that direction. And it's, well, it's slightly to the west of southwest, but very close. And because there's a weight in the end, then if it's not blowing at all, it hangs down. If it's blowing incredibly hard, it's straight out. And we've got well, it's a fairly strong wind today. You certainly take off very easily indeed. And they take off more or less straight down this track here. So this is our runway. Now, the question is, will it fly? I think it's a bit dodgy in this wind myself. Looks like sort of four, five or six to me. But I reckon if we, uh, southwest, southwest, that's right. Start the engine. Ready, go. Hooray! Fantastic. I'm going to go, ah. Uh, oh. Well, well, it was a moderate flight, a little bit of pilot error, but we'd probably correct that next time. A southwesterly runway and its proximity to central London were to make Croydon Airport a major success. Flights from here went all over the world. Well, to Paris, Amsterdam and Rotterdam to begin with. It soon became the country's official customs airport, dealing with all international flights. The age of air travel had begun. In 1928, the airport was getting busier and busier, and they built this new terminal a mile and a half away. Isn't it fantastic? This was state of the art, and Croydon was by then the busiest airport in Europe. They even built an airport hotel. Look, the Aerodrome Hotel. All the poshest people stayed there. George VI, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Mary Pickford, Amy Johnson, Charlie Chaplin, you name it. They had wonderful views of the airfield and crowds used to gather on the roof. They had to specially strengthen the roof to take the crowds. It's now an office complex, but a lot of the old Croydon Airport looks much the same as it did almost 80 years ago. Even the control tower at the back of the building has been kept intact with some of its original features. Oh. The point of having a control tower is that from up here you get a fabulous view. The controllers would come out of there and they would look around and they could see all the aircraft on the ground, maybe waiting to take off or taxiing, and they could use the binoculars to spot aircraft coming in to land. Later on, when they had radios, they could signal to all of them and say, no, no, wait a bit, there's somebody taking off, you can land in a few minutes or something like that. But the great thing about this is you do get a fabulous view.
and this is the control tower and this is where the controller sat and basically air traffic control began here in the early days they didn't have radios or anything and they used to fly well, by landmarks. They used to fly along roads or along railway lines. And in 1922, there was a terrible crash because two pilots were flying along the same railway line in opposite directions, and they ran head-on into one another. And so then people realised they had to have rules for flying. And one of the simple rules was that if you were going to follow a road or a railway line, you kept 100 yards to the right of it. So if you were flying this way, you'd keep 100 yards to the right. Flying this way, you'd keep 100 yards to the right. And then you'd miss one another. And really, air traffic control began here at Croydon. In fact, the very first air traffic controller here, who invented a system for following each flight with a slip of paper in a little wooden frame like that, was a chap called... George James Horatio Jets. And look at that. He's got air traffic control certificate number one. Low cloud, fog, or any really bad weather were real problems because visibility was so poor the control tower wouldn't be able to see the aircraft. In fact, the pilot wouldn't know where he was, but luckily the air traffic controllers could work it out using radio. Now, the way they did that was to send in a radio signal here to Croydon and ask for a fix. And there was a bloke sitting in this chair with his headphones on and his microphone, and he would say, OK, put out a signal. So the pilot would then put out a continuous signal. And the chap sitting here would use his goniometer here. He'd twiddle this round, listening for the strongest signal coming in. And suppose it was just... 90 degrees, like that. That was the strongest. Then he'd go over to the map here and he'd pull out this bit of string from Croydon at 90 degrees, like that. And he knew that the aircraft was then somewhere along this line. But of course he didn't know how far along the line. However, the same signal would be picked up by someone in Kent and he'd also take a fix on this and it might be, say, in this direction. They say 75 degrees. And also a third picker up in, in uh, Norwich in Norfolk here, and he would go down, and maybe it's down there. And in theory, these three lines should cross at a point. Usually there was a little margin of error, so you get a little triangle, and you know the aircraft is probably in that triangle. This took them a minute or so, and so they were able to go back to the pilot and say, OK, we reckon you're just east of Margate, and if you fly due west, you'll get to Croydon maybe in an hour or so. You should be there in time for tea. By the end of the Second World War, aircraft had got bigger and heavier. And because there was no room for expansion, this was the beginning of the end for Croydon International. Sadly, none of the big aircraft that flew out of Croydon carry passengers anymore. But there is one smaller one, and they tell me that it's airworthy. This is Barry Hughes, and this, I think, is a Dragon... De Havilland Dragon Rapide, is that right? De Havilland Dragon Rapide, yes. So, did these things fly out of Croydon? These aircraft were traditionally built as a passenger aircraft, and yes, they... Um first saw life out of Croydon. They'd done such routes as uh, trips over towards Paris, they'd also do more local routes to the Channel Islands. And who would have flown? Normal members of the public, probably slightly more affluent at the time, that <laughs> rich. wanted to, uh, <laughs> rich, yes. to travel the, uh, the world and see the sights of Europe. I guess if you wanted to hop over to Paris for the weekend, you must have been rich, mustn't you? Yes, at the time. Anyway, now, can, can you really take me up in this? Yeah, it's no problem at all. I've been flying the aircraft for about uh, seven years now. Ah, all right, good, good. How, uh, how old is it? The aircraft was built in 1943, so it's just... 43? That's the year I was born in. <laughs> well, I hope it's not feeling as old as I am. OK, so do I just climb in here? Yeah, if you just climb in and if you'd like to take a seat behind me, uh, the pilot's copy at the very front of the aircraft. I thought I should have a go myself and see what it was like for those affluent globetrotters of the 30s. Ah, here we go. Take off. The very last plane to fly out of Croydon Airport took off on the 30th of September, 1959. 
really nice. It's very comfortable, very smooth, no bumping, less, less frightening than I expected. It may have been the rise of Gatwick and Stansted during the war that weakened Croydon as a viable airport, but the real nail in the coffin was to come from the small West London villages of Perry Oaks and Heath Row. Airports and the aviation industry have not only affected the economy, the culture and the global standing of London, they've also helped to shape the landscape of the capital. In 1944, the government studied the needs of post-war civil aviation and found the existing facilities were somewhat lacking. The land surrounding a small aerodrome based in the hamlet of Heath Row was laid with enough concrete to build a road from London to Edinburgh as Britain's largest ever engineering project became the new London airport. This uh, proving flight starts off from Heath Row, which will be the future civil airport of London. And it takes off from the finest runway in the world. Once the Second World War was over, a master plan was developed to build terminals and an air traffic control tower, although construction didn't actually start until 1951. However, the technical advances in the aircraft during the Second World War led to some important milestones in commercial passenger aircraft. The jet age took off from Heathrow in 1952, when the world's first turbojet, the British-built de Havilland Comet 1, flew from Heathrow on a scheduled flight to Johannesburg. The Comet was a huge leap forward in technology. Never before had a passenger aircraft been designed to fly so high and so fast. And the engineers who designed and built it were wrestling with new materials, new concepts, new production methods, and they didn't even have computers. Fantastic. The future of the British air industry looked bright, and BOAC, who operated and maintained the comets from Heathrow, were viewed as a seriously cutting-edge airline. But it was not to last. The fantastic success of the comet came to an end after two devastating crashes. I met Chris Giles to find out what happened. What went wrong with Comet 1? Well, what happened was, in the early days, the, uh, the knowledge about materials and fatigue wasn't known. So the stresses on certain components, like the rivets here... So it was the rivets? What would happen is a rivet hole has um, a high stress area, and after the fatigue, the cracks would propagate from the holes of the rivets out to the next weakest point and then just carry on, and the pressure of the aircraft would open it up like a, a, a tin can, really. So it just sort of unzipped and, and then exploded. Terrifying. In a way, it's a pity being the pioneer, isn't it? Because if you make mistakes, it's much harder to remedy and you, you suffer all the consequences. A major aspect of air safety is pilot training. And in August 1953, BOAC started training pilots on the ground using a brand new flight simulator. At Heathrow today, it's got a lot more advanced. This is a state-of-the-art simulator. You can see the whole thing's moving around like mad. It's sitting on six hydraulic legs, which can move the whole thing in any direction. So they can go up to take off, down to land, bank, and all this sort of thing. They feel all the G-forces you'd feel when you're flying the, the real aircraft. It is wonderful to have six tons of machinery being tossed around like a toy. Clear for takeoff. One, two, three, go. Oh. Oh, I've broken it now. Sadly, I'm not allowed to take off, even though it isn't the real thing. But it's impressive, this, this 3D believability. The amazing effect is created by wraparound projection in front of the windows. 
But at Heathrow today, they're preparing staff for one of the biggest changes the airport has ever seen using an even bigger 360 degrees projection simulator. Wow, this is it, this is fantastic. This is an exact model, full life size, of the new VCR, as they call it, the visual control room on the new control tower. And if you look, there's a panoramic view of the entire airport. And there are planes sort of taxiing about and landing and taking off. Sorry, hello, Dale. I didn't see you Hi. there in the darkness. So this is what you come and play games with. Is. It's, it's like uh, having a computer game. It's not quite the same. This is what the controllers use to train for the different perspective for the new control tower. What do they do now to control the planes? At the moment, we uh, still use the old paper strips. Oh, just like at Croydon. Three one seven nine, clear take off two seven left. Surface wind is two eight zero twelve. That's amazing. So literally, it's a piece of paper stuck in a piece of plastic. You're still using this stuff from sort of fifty years yeah, ago. Very very simple. The orange holder for the inbound airplane. Oh, and, and blue for the. And blue for the outbound. Take off. Okay, right. smashing. Well, what about the new one? the new stuff, is that going to be easy? Uh, it'll be just the same. It won't be any easier or more difficult. Right. We'll have electronic flight progress strips which will make sharing of information a lot simpler. OK. Oh, can I put the headphones on? Better have. Good. Ah, so what we've got here is a replica of that old paper strip. That's right. And by touching on the screen, it replicates the movements that we do with the old strips in the old control tower. How amazing. I mean, I would have thought you'd have some sort of fancy new thing. You're, you're just replicating the old, uh, you know, Stone it's Age stuff. It's a tried and tested method. Uh, yes, OK. Speed red 125, line up runway 27 left. So you can see the aircraft is pointing down the runway. Oh, yes. Speedbird 125, cleared for takeoff, runway 27 left. <laughs> oh, he's going. He's rolling. There, he's off. Hooray! I got a plane into the air. I wonder if he ever got anywhere. This is the Visual Control Room, or VCR, of the new control tower. It was built off site so as to reduce disruption of the airport operations. Late at night, while the airport was not being used, the 900-ton structure was wheeled into place and carefully positioned over its foundation. The VCR was winched up in stages, allowing sections of steel tower to be inserted underneath, until, after 12 long weeks, it reached its full height of 87 metres. The completed control tower was then lowered onto its permanent foundation next to Terminal 3 and surrounded by aircraft stands and taxiways, right at the heart of Heathrow Airport. And this is it. This is the new visual control room, the new control tower, built by the Richard Rogers Partnership, who also built the Pompidou Centre in France and the uh, Lloyds Building in London. Oh, yes, and the Millennium Dome. And it's 87 metres high, nearly twice as high as Nelson's Column. With the result, you get the most fantastic view from here. It's huge, great big windows you can see around the entire airport. And if you look here, there's a plane just taking off. It's Kenya Airways. It's off to Nairobi. Wow. It looks much too heavy to get into the air. The great thing about being this high is that for the first time ever, I've got a really good view of how the airport works. I've got a map now. Because if you look, there are two runways. There's one over there and there's one over there, parallel. OK? And the left-hand one is used for landings. There's a plane actually landing as we speak. And the right-hand one is used for taking off. And there's a plane beginning its takeoff run as we speak. Between the two runways is the central terminal area here. That's terminals 1, 2, and 3. They're all clustered together. Terminal 1 over on the left, terminal 2 at the far side, and terminal 3 this side with all these planes on their stands. And it, it, you see signs saying terminal 1, terminal 2, but they might as well all be the same building almost. They're not quite. Over there is Terminal 4, the other side of the takeoff runway, and miles away by road. And then, round here, we have the new terminal, Terminal 5, which will be coming into operation early in 2008. And that is absolutely enormous. And almost all the British Airways flights and a few others will move there, and that will greatly increase the capacity. Now, 
the number of movements, that's takeoffs and landings, is capped at 480,000 a year. That's the maximum that's allowed. And the number of passengers handled at the moment by Heathrow is 68 million. That's the same as the population of Britain. Extraordinary, the whole lot flying out or in uh, every year. But with the Terminal 5, the capacity for passengers is going to increase by 30 million. That's by nearly 50%. So, why build another terminal for more passengers if there aren't going to be any extra planes? Well, the answer is because of this, the Airbus A380. This was the very first one to land at Heathrow in May 2006. It carries at least 550 passengers. That's 300 more than a standard plane and 150 more than the already huge jumbos. Will extra passenger capacity be the way forward for air travel, rather than the high speeds of Concorde or the spacious luxury of the early passenger aircraft? Who knows what the future will hold? Airports make London one of the world's leading cities. They're a vital economic force, generating £5 billion every year, and there's little doubt that their economic importance will continue to expand. But they're not universally popular. Airports have always generated opposition from people who live close to them. And there's no doubt at all that aircraft are noisy, polluting beasts. So the future expansion of London airports is bound to be controversial.